My name is Wendell Griffin. I am pastor of Millennium Church in Little Rock, Arkansas. I'm also a circuit judge for the 6th Judicial District of Arkansas, the 5th Division, a state court. I'm a state court trial judge in Arkansas, living in Little Rock, Arkansas. You're also um, a board member in the Samuel Whit Proctor Conference. Indeed I am. Talk to me about uh, the importance of Samuel Whit Proctor Conference. The Samuel Whit Proctor Conference is, as the name indicates a conference in the name of Samuel Dewey Proctor who was among other things a pastor, an African American pastor, pastor of the Baptist Church in New York. He was a theologian, he was an educator, he was a social activist, he was a mentor and in that same spirit the Samuel Dewey Proctor Conference labors to inform, educate, mentor, encourage and also act as an agitating force for social justice in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, and particularly with the perspective of black people in the United States and as our experience is relevant for people of color around the world. And vulnerable people around the world, not just people of color, vulnerable people around the world. Hendricks was in his workshop this morning. I think something it very well. Uh, the Hebrew word that occurs most often in scripture is mishpat, M-I-S-H-P-H-A-T. Literally translated righteousness, but it literally means justice. And so for me, justice, as I put it on my emails, justice is a verb. It's not just a noun. Justice is a verb. Justice is what we must do. And so what I try to do as a judge is keep faith to the principles of our republic, always mindful that I am a citizen of two realms. And my citizenship as a follower of Jesus influences and is the prism through which I understand all of the other ethical relationships that I deal with as a judge. So that's how I try to apply my faith as a judge, not as a prelate, but literally as a secular judge who is mindful that every judge has values. My value system is defined, informed, and motivated by the teachings of Jesus Christ. The faith community is being challenged and called by the experiences we've seen in Ferguson. First of all, Ferguson is both an example of what's going on in Ferguson, but is also an example of what's happening in so many places around this country and around the world where vulnerable people are marginalized, oppressed by what we are talking about in practicum, reinvented empire. And so the faith community has a responsibility to challenge, to condemn, to convict, and hopefully, in the name of the Holy Spirit, be as agent of conversion of these instruments of reinventing the power. The second thing I think the faith community has to do is to grow. Because what Ferguson has challenged our community with has been the need to expand our notion of who is called and how calling works its way out. We've seen some wonderful called out young brothers and sisters who have not been licensed by anybody's church, who haven't been ordained by anybody, but the Spirit of God has laid hands on them. And they are activists in the name of Jesus. We've seen some people who are gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, who have come to the table of justice and challenge the church concerning injustice and Black Lives Matter when people of faith have been reluctant. We've seen some people who are not black do that. And so the faith community has a challenging responsibility, but faith is also, faith is also being called. 
The grand jury system dates back to the Magna Carta, uh, some 900 years ago. And so it is an old system. Some would say, and I think with good reason, it is an antiquated system uh, because it is a system by which the sovereign allows individuals, members of the community, to decide whether or not a person is charged with committing a crime. Uh, and the purpose for it in antiquity was to keep the sovereign from having total control over who got charged with crimes. So you didn't have the king having total control over who got charged with crimes. You had individuals. Playing. What we've seen in Ferguson and in Staten Island has been a perversion of the system. Because most people who are charged with crimes are not charged with grand jury. Most crimes are charged by the prosecuting attorney. As a matter of fact, in Ferguson, after Mike Brown was killed, people who were accused of looting, and were accused of looting, were not charged by grand jury. On the other hand, Darren Wilson, who killed somebody, was taken to a grand jury. You had 16 people who testified. We saw him kill somebody who had his hands up. So that shows some of the challenges, some of the flaws of the grand jury. It is used as a political instrument now. And the old saw is among lawyers that a grand jury will indict a ham sandwich. Uh, and because the idea is the grand jury is totally in the code trouble of the, for the prosecutor. And so a prosecutor can build a case in a grand jury to basically indict, as the saying goes, a ham sandwich. On the other hand, as we saw with Mike Brown, as we saw in the case of Eric Garner in Staten Island, the prosecutor can pervert the grand jury. And that's what happened in Robert McCullough's case. Robert McCullough perverted the grand jury process, and so he basically made a mini trial. Because the purpose of a grand jury, the standard of grand jury, is whether or not there is reasonable ground to believe that a crime has been committed and that the person charged, or person to be charged, committed the crime. So, it's preponderance of the evidence. It's not really, it's, it's lower than the proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And the defendant doesn't get a chance to bring a lawyer in. The prosecutor calls all the witnesses. The prosecutor can decide who to call. And so the prosecutor can basically make a case to charge if he or she pleases. What we saw in Darren Wilson's case is the prosecutor treated Darren Wilson as if he was his client, as opposed to treated Darren Wilson as the suspect. The difference is that Darren Wilson was not really rigorously examined. Those of us who know anything about law, and I consider myself among them, uh, know the difference between the kind of examination that Darren Wilson got, and I read his testimony, I read his examination, and the kind of examination you give someone who is a target defendant before a grand jury. Because remember, that person doesn't have a lawyer in there beside them. The person can't make an objection. The prosecutor is playing things with a net down. And when you read Darren Wilson's examination for the grand jury, the persons who testified that they saw Darren Wilson kill Mike Brown Jr. while Mike Brown Jr. had his hands up were examined much more rigorously than Darren Wilson was the killer. That's the real problem with the grand jury. Last, and I should say this, the grand jury in Darren Wilson's case not only was mistreated in terms of the way the case was presented to them, the law was mistreated to them. Since 1985, the Supreme Court of the United States has said that a state cannot basically license police officers to shoot fleeing felons and exercise their force. But in Darren Wilson's case, the prosecutor at the beginning of the grand jury told them, before we start, you gotta understand this is the law. And they showed them a Missouri law that was in direct violation of U.S. Supreme Court law. So in 2014, a grand jury in Missouri gets the wrong law that was outlawed in 1985. Jamie, thank you for your witness. Thank you for your work. 
and thank you for the way you allow us to speak our faith.